I'm back with more from Carolina Lindhead. Uh, this is a chapter called The Depression Years. As follows. I was born in Rock Hill, South Carolina, and our family lived in Welford, Clinton, and Greer, South Carolina, before we moved to Tuckapaw when I was about nine years old. So I grew up there. Our first house was in the Red Egypt community, downhill from Main Street, overlooking a barbed wire fence and a cow pasture. The Paget family lived on one side and the Emory family on the other. I have vivid memories of the elderly Mrs. Emory sitting on a stool on her back porch, chugging away at the churn, making buttermilk to drink, and butter to put into a pad to shape it into homemade butter. The Emory's cat cat and we didn't, but I envied them. We didn't have a bathroom. In fact, we didn't have plumbing or an indoor toilet. The only facilities we had was an outside privy separate from the house. It was a two-holder, meaning it could accommodate two persons at one time but I can't remember when two persons tried to use it at the same time. It was the first time I can recall that we didn't have running water in the house. Earlier in Welford, Clinton, and Greer, we were in cotton mill villages but had running water in the houses. There were flies plenty in Tuckapaw. There were so many that during the day we would wave towels to shoe as many as we could through the screenless windows, which we then closed. It's a wonder we never got any sickness from germs that flies usually carry. I remember that our mother was quite concerned about this, but we, as children, could care less. Flies were just a part of living. I don't remember where our water came from, but we carried it in metal buckets from wherever. The only source I can remember was a hand-operated water pump at the stretch of houses up the hill on Main Street, visible from our house. As for bathing, think of ten tubs and Saturday night. I don't even like to recall those days. In fairness, it's important to remember one thing. Not all tuckaball houses were completely without water which early was extended primarily to houses on the major streets. It was the World War II era before water service was extended to the houses on other streets. One summer, we waterless kids in the Red Egypt area got venturesome and to cool off dug out a swimming pool just inside the barbed wire fence pasture in front of our house. The shallow pool spot was two or three feet wide, four or five feet long, and took a week of hard work. The older folks just sat on the front porch and laughed at our efforts to get cool. We didn't have any running water to fill the pool, so we figured rainwater would do it. But it didn't rain. It's a wonder some careless cow did not stumble into it. We didn't worry because it was only about a foot deep, and not deeper because we found early that digging a swimming pool involved more hard work than we had expected. That's why it was only less than a foot deep. We eventually just abandoned it. In the front yard between the house and the barbed wire fence, pasture was an open space where we played kick the can. We used a crimped tin can as a ball and a make-do wooden bat of whatever piece of wooden plank we could find. Home base and all the other bases were in different places in different games and the rules were unbelievably simple and changed from game to game. You merely swung the bat, hit the can, and ran like hell. 
Older boys, such as neighbors Hank Emery and Bobby Paget, were experts at this. The kitchen part of the house was level with the backyard, but the front porch overlooking the pasture was about five feet high. This gave a lot of room for playing under the porch in rainy weather, and we spent a lot of time building roads of mud and driving imaginary cars along them. Toy, <coughs> pardon me, toy cars were few and far between. Such deprivation is why in more affluent years later, we took our children to the supermarket and bought toys for them. You wouldn't believe how many plastic cars, trucks, books, and other stuff we now have piled in the corner of one room in our house, just waiting for one or more of the grandsons to visit. My mother was always nagging my dad to get another house, one with running water, window screens, and a real toilet. You could imagine the excitement when he came home one day with news that such a house was available on Maple Street on the other side of the river. He got someone with a truck to do the moving, and before long we were set up. Well, we had an indoor toilet that flushed, but we had no running water in the kitchen. We had a built-in sink in the kitchen, but still had to carry our kitchen water. There was an outside spigot in the backyard of the house just a hundred or so yards away. The house was occupied by Mrs. Freeman, an older lady who also cooked four or five box dinners daily for persons who worked in the mill. One summer I got the job of delivering the dinners the block or two to the employees at the mill. There was a heady odor of fresh corn, fried chicken, cantaloupe and vegetables, and it was all I could do to refrain from devouring all of them before delivering them. Anyway, Ms. Freeman didn't object to having neighbors without catching water to keep a steady stream of carriers between their own houses and her backyard. She had running water in her kitchen, but it was mighty kind of her to be imposed on like that but the sense of community was great. It was as though, we're all in this thing together. Let's get along and help each other out. Our stay in that small house on Maple Street was short. The next move was to a house of the same design and size, just a few feet away and around the corner at 2 Oak Street. The previous occupants were Vance Jackson and his wife Rosetta and their daughter Patricia. They were lucky enough to move into a house they had built on the Boiling Springs Road near Lyman, South Carolina. We were fortunate that Vance had bulldozed and planted the front yard of our new house with nitrogen-loaded peas, and for many years we had the neatest, grassiest front yard in the neighborhood. The new house was good news. The bad news was that we didn't, still didn't have kitchen water, although we had a working indoor toilet. After we got water, one of the first things I did after being discharged from the Army was to have a clothes washer, a front loader Bendix, installed in the kitchen. That's when we threw away the scrubbing board for the washing and the black iron pot we used to build a fire for our laundry in the backyard. Later, I got reckless and even installed a clothes dryer. Now everybody takes all those things for granted. Never at any point did we have central heating in any of the cotton mill houses my family used. Heating was always provided by open grates using coal we hauled from the pile of coal in the backyard. 
we had a lot of hands and arms, but nobody ever volunteered to haul the coal for the night's only heat. But Daddy, I brought in the coal last night. It's Jack's turn tonight. Thank goodness for temperate southern weather. While I was away in the Army during World War II, somebody installed a circulating oil heater connected to an outside source at our house. But I never bothered questioning where it came from. It did a fair job of heating the small house, at least the living room, and was the closest thing we ever got to central heating. Over the years, everyone moved away, and the only occupant of our house on Oak Street was my mother. Following her death, it was sold and unfortunately later burned. The property was bought by someone else who installed a trailer type vehicle, which is still there. Every time I return to Tuckapaw, I drive around to Oak Street, which I knew as home for a long time, and wonder who lives in that trailer type house. The site was my home for a long time and I spent much of my growing up years there, wondering when I was going to get old enough to go join the real outside world. But always being in a hurry, I heave a breath of thanks and thankfully start the four plus hour drive back to Virginia. That's the end of Oak Street Depression years. Thank you for watching.